This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome, I'm Aishan Hutchinson, the current director of the graduate writing program here at Cornell. This event is happening on the traditional homelands of the Gaikano, the Cayuga Nation. The Gaikano are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The, Confeder the Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gaikono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaikono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Following these very brief housekeeping remarks, our distinguished guest, Jennifer Egan, will be introduced by Maz Do, a second year fiction graduate student. On the behalf of my colleagues in the creative writing program, I wish to extend my immense gratitude to our donors, Barbara and David Zelaznik. It is their generosity and support which continue to make this reading series an ongoing nourishment for many across our campus and beyond. And, we're, and for that, we're extremely grateful. Heartfelt thanks to Amanda Lynn Bruckner, our MFA graduate coordinator, and to Emily Parsons, uh, the office manager for the Literatures in, Depart Literatures in English department. I thank them for their tireless work on each of these events and for making the events a success. Uh, please take a moment to silence your cell phones or destroy them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there will be one more reading in our spring series, and you can find more information on our website and on the bookmarks and flyers avail available to pick up at the bookseller's desk. Now, please join me in giving a hand to Mazdo, who will now introduce Jennifer Egan. Maz. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Aishian. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. My name is Maz, and I'm a second year fiction writer in the MFA program here at Cornell. <laughs> it's my great privilege to introduce Jennifer Egan, whose visionary writing has shaped and continues to shape the contemporary literary landscape. Egan is the author of several novels and a short story collection. Her 2017 novel, Manhattan Beach, a New York Times bestseller was awarded the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and was chosen as New York City's One Book, One New York Read. Her previous novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and was named one of the best books of the decade by Time Magazine and Entertainment Weekly. Egan has written frequently in the New York Times Magazine, and she recently completed a term as the president of PEN America. Her newest book, The Candy House, a sibling to A Visit from the Goon Squad, was published in April 2022 and was selected as one of President Obama's favorite books of the year. The Candy House, of which each MFA student was lucky enough to receive a copy, has taught me that to enter Egan's work is to relinquish oneself to the outer limits of imagination. Her writing sets a high watermark of innovation by rupturing fiction as a form, whether that's on the level of language, character, or structure. Still, the book never loses sight of the elemental prerogative of storytelling, the task of bringing readers from one sentence to the next. The Candy House opens casually with a confession. I have this craving just to talk. From there on, the reader engages in an exercise in narrative maximalism, slipping through characters and decades and blurring the distinctions of time and place. Every page orients itself towards the central question, which is, what does it truly mean to share and hold memory? In the Candy House, memory, fallible, ephemeral, is assembled through a series of refractions. The implication is that memory is a collective endeavor which links humanity through the impossible pursuit of constructing the whole. As a writer and reader, I believe this idea is at the heart of fiction itself. After the reading, I invite everyone to join us for a book signing and reception right outside. Um, thanks to Buffalo Street Books, 
Books are available for purchase here in the auditorium. Now, I'm thrilled to wel welcome Jennifer Egan to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here um, with this very typical Ithaca weather. I've been enjoying it. Um, <laughs> I love Ithaca. My son is a senior here and an English major, I'm proud to say. Um, and one of the great joys of this institution, in addition to the education he's received, has been the chance for me to visit a lot. Uh, I'm going to miss Ithaca. It's really a wonderful place. So thank you for having me, um, and it's, it's great to be in your company. So before I read, I'm going to talk just for a minute about my writing method. Um, which I'll be illustrating a little bit in, in the reading. Um, the method involves basically spewing out blind improvisational first drafts by hand that hopefully will give me ideas and uh, possibilities that I can't think of consciously. I try to write first drafts from the part of my brain, I guess, or the part of all of our brains that dreams, that turns the stuff of our lives into things that we basically don't understand, but we know that they have meaning. A Visit from the Goon Squad was published in 2010, and it basically began this same improvisational way. I thought I was writing freestanding short stories. I was, in fact, procrastinating about writing Manhattan Beach. <laughs> Amazing what you can get done procrastinating. Um, and at a certain point, I realized that these three stories that I had actually felt like part of one book, even though they were very different from each other. So in a way, the, the so-called innovations of A Visit from the Goon Squad came about really by accident, because they were already true of these three stories. Each one had a different protagonist. Each one stood on its own. I mean, those are the basics of a short story. Um, and each one had a different mood and vibe and feel and sort of a technical approach. And that was because I didn't think they were part of one book. But I liked that and tried to hold on to it. And the fun of, of this kind of ensemble book, if you find it fun, is the, the juxtapositions, the surprise of seeing things one way in, in one sort of world and then seeing them again uh, with no regard for chronology in a different way. Often a contradictory way, that, that um, juxtaposition can be an abrasion, and I actually don't mind that. Um, so uh, the Candy House is very different from A Visit from the Goon Squad, but it actually shares those, those three structural traits. Each chapter is about different people, each stands on its own, and each is written in a different way, often in non-traditional ways, if I can make them work. It's not easy. Uh, the lots of characters appear in both books, but there's really only one that I would say is a major character in both books, and it's a guy named Lou Klein, who many find to be the least sympathetic character in A Visit from the Goon Squad, which may be one reason I wanted to take another crack at him. Um, he's also the oldest character in both books, oldest major character, born in 1935. Uh, and his daughter, Charlene, or Charlie, figures um, in the, two uh, the, two, the beginnings of two adjacent chapters that I'm going to read to you tonight to give you a sense of what that collision or abrasion or juxtaposition can feel like. And so both of these involve Lou Klein, but I'm just going to read the very beginnings of each. The first is called The Mystery of Our Mother. Long ago, she told us, when we were just a hope in her heart, or not even that, because she never wanted children, or thought she didn't, a higher power touched our mother's head and said, stop what you're doing, two little girls are waiting to be born, and you need to have them right away because the world is desperate for their brightness. So she stopped studying anthropology, which she really did love, and maybe would study again someday when you're all grown up and don't need me anymore. We'll always need you. I'll always need you too, that's for sure. I'll try not to drive you crazy with my mommy needs. Till the end. Well, I stopped going to anthropology school, and I married your daddy, and we brought you into the world, and here you are. It all worked out perfectly. Where is daddy? You'll see him next week. He's taking you to ballet. Last time he never came. 
I'll be here just in case. He can't make a bun. That's not important, honey. Before ballet, don't whine, sweetie. He threw Tam Tam out the window of the car. He said she was moth-eaten. That was unfortunate. How could you marry him? Love is a mystery. Does Daddy love you? He loves you. That's what matters. He said we were young spendthrifts. Did he now? He said, "Can we not talk about what he said? We're just telling you. I don't need to be told. I know your father very well." How did she endure these conversations? Of course, our father didn't love her any more than she loved him. He was 15 years older than our mother, twice divorced when they met, with four kids, two by each ex-wife. How's that for a rotten prospective husband? But he was charming, a famous record producer, and above all, we later surmised he wouldn't take no for an answer. Why he wanted our mother to say yes is another mystery. They had nothing in common. Beyond a taste for beauty, his and beauty, hers, but she never lived by her beauty. She was the kind of mom who rarely wore makeup, who let her hair grow wild, and didn't bother to shower on Sunday, her day off from the travel agency where she went to work after our father stranded her without any money to raise us. The sun gnawed apartment complex where we lived with our mother, starting as toddlers in the late 1970s, the first home we remember, seemed to be populated entirely by females, aging B-movie actresses who took deliveries of Gallo wine in gallon bottles, <laughs> and aspiring starlets whose much older boyfriends had white stripes on their ring fingers. The apartments surrounded a garden. Containing a single gargantuan palm tree, either a relic of some agricultural prehistory of that patch of land, or a decorative feature that had bloated grotesquely out of scale with the modest complex it was decorating. The bedroom we shared with our mother faced a canopy of fronds, like the fingers of a dozen hands. Even on sunny days, it made a sound like rain. On Sunday mornings, we climbed into our mother's bed to be the monster. Which meant lying with our chests on top of hers, so that all of us could feel our three beating hearts, our hair tangled with her hair, and our breath melted into hers until we were one creature, lying under the moving, whispering hands of another creature, the palm tree. The tree had a name. We told our mother, Herbert. <laughs> What if it's a girl tree? A girl can be Herbert. <laughs> our mother propped herself on one elbow and studied us. There aren't a lot of men around here, are there? Do you wish you saw more of your daddy? No, he loves you very much. We love you. You can love us both, you know. No, we can't. Our parents' marriage collapsed when a San Francisco high school student washed up on their Malibu doorstep, having run away from home and hitchhiked south after our father seduced her on a business trip. We were three and four years old. Our father managed, on paper, to appear penniless. He left our mother with nothing but us, which, by his calculation, probably meant less than nothing. But to our mother, who had little else, we were infinite. She loved us infinitely in return and gave us that rare thing—a happy childhood. She never told us why she'd left our father. Much later, he did. On the occasions when our father showed up to take us to ballet, we walked grimly down the cracked outdoor steps from our second-story apartment to one of his many cars. Hello, girls. One of you want to ride in front? We shook our heads. It wasn't safe. Everyone knew that except him. How about something to eat? We've got time before your class. We don't eat before ballet. I can't do anything right with you two, can I? We shook our heads. And he laughed and began to drive, but when he pulled up in front of the strip mall where the ballet studio was, he turned around and peered at us in the back seat. "I'm your father. You understand that, don't you?" We nodded in stony unison. "That's not nothing. That means something." He searched our cold eyes. "You don't like me. Why?" It was not a rhetorical question. He was curious, awaiting a reply. We looked at our father closely for perhaps the first time. 
his weathered surfer's tan and longish blonde hair, his crooked front teeth. He watched us watch him, and then he laughed. How would you know? You're just two little kids. One day after ballet, our father told us that we weren't going straight home. We glowered. Does mommy know? Of course your mother knows. What do you think I am, a kidnapper? He drove severely, our lack of enthusiasm clearly needling him. We played rock, paper, scissors in the back seat and pretended he wasn't there. Hey, try looking around for a change. We were driving along a cliff, the ocean shivering enormously below. It seemed a different world from the parched, flat one we inhabited with our mother, full of glittering cars in broiling asphalt lots. Eventually, we descended the cliff and pulled into the driveway of a house with tiled roofs and magenta flowers overflowing its walls. There were no other houses around it. Rock and roll crashed from inside the house, but our father walked us straight past it to a beach whose fine white sand was different from Venice Beach, where our mother often took us on Sunday afternoons. Where are the people? It's a private beach. We're the only ones who can be here. Is it yours? Yes, it's mine. Go ahead, run around, have some fun. We stood watching him. Come on, play. When we failed to move, he said, I've never seen a pair of kids who wouldn't play. It's your beach. I'm your father. My beach is your beach. We like beaches with people. You're very tough, you two. Does your mother ever tell you that? We shook our heads. Ah, so I'm seeing the real you. The real you, plural. No, she is. She may think so, but I know better. Visibly heartened by this notion, he unbuttoned his Hawaiian shirt. Our father wore shorts year-round, day and night, but we'd never seen him bare-chested. It turned out that today, maybe always, his shorts were actually swim trunks. Come on, kiddos, he said, taking our hands and trotting us over the powdery sand toward the sea. We don't have bathing suits. You're wearing leotards, that's the same thing. It was true. We each wore a sleeveless danskin with an elastic-waisted ballet skirt pulled over it and the soft leather ballet slippers we'd gotten for Christmas. Wait, we need to take off our skirts. He paused while we slid them off and folded them neatly on top of our ballet slippers, two little piles in the blinding white. I like that, the way you take good care of your things. We stepped into the shimmering water with our father. The absence of a crowd, of music playing on boom boxes, of roller skaters and dogs and cigarette butts and popsicle sticks buried in the sand made it seem like an imaginary beach. We swam with our father. We were seven and eight years old, and we remembered that swim as the first time, nice time we ever had with him. He learned pigtails, ponytails, even ballet buns, which he sculpted fastidiously, insisting on starting over again if hairs were stray or sloppy or caught. Other parents smiled at the sight of him, pinching bobby pins between his lips. Everyone knew who he was. He'd made the careers of enough rock stars to be a star himself. People joked with him and tried to act like they knew him better than they did. Our father froze them out. He was prim in our company, as if his fame were a dull encumbrance he would have liked to be rid of. Our father's swimming pool looked nothing like the garish turquoise tubs we'd glimpsed in apartment complexes near ours, littered with palm tree debris. His pool was the color of stone, full of lightly salted water, accessible from almost every room in the house. The pool was to his home, what the palm tree was to ours. On our second visit, he evaluated our swim strokes, found them dangerously wanting, and arranged for twice-weekly lessons with an instructor in his pool. Occasionally, we stayed for dinner. Eduardo, our father's cook, made fajitas and guacamole and pitchers of margaritas for whoever was around, usually some combination of our four half-siblings, whom we barely knew, and musicians our father was working with. Under a cast-iron chandelier whose fat candles dripped wax into the middle of a massive slab of dining table, 
Our father grew loud and loose, a showman we didn't recognize or like. Look at Lana and Melora, he said one night. They don't approve. Everyone turned, and we felt our faces get hot. They're tough customers, those two. They've got me doing pigtails and buns. Incredulous laughter. I don't believe you, said Charlie, our oldest sister. She dragged her chair next to our father and offered him her golden hair, which fell almost to her waist. Make a bun, she dared him. Our father gathered Charlie's hair in his fists, but seemed unsure at first what to do with it. Girls, he roused us, get me the pins and brush. Serious, stickler, came the table howls. Our father brushed Charlie's hair until it crackled in the candlelight. Then he herded it into a shimmering bundle and looped it expertly around, pins pursed between his teeth. Silence fell on the room as everyone watched. Our father slid the pins into Charlie's hair and anchored in place a beautiful, shining bun. It made Charlie look like a little girl, although she must have been in her 20s by then. Laughter broke at the table, and everyone clapped. Charlie's eyes brimmed and overflowed. I don't know why I'm crying, she kept saying as she flicked away the tears, but they wouldn't stop. We knew why. We were getting the best of him. That chapter goes on, but I'm going to skip ahead to the next chapter, which also involves Lou and Charlie, the daughter we just saw getting her hair put in a bun. <laughs> This takes place much earlier. What the Forest Remembers. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there was a forest. It's gone now, burned, and the four men walking in it are gone too which is what makes it far away. Neither it nor they exist. But in June 1965, the Redwoods have a velvety, primeval look that brings to mind leprechauns or gin or fairies. Three of the four men have never been in these ancient woods, and to them, the forest looks otherworldly, so removed is it from their everyday vistas of wives and children and offices. The oldest, Lou Klein, is only 31, but all were born in the 1930s and raised without antibiotics, their military service completed before they went to college. Men of their generation got started on adulthood right away. So, four men moving among trees whose musculature resembles the thighs of giants. When the men throw back their heads to search the sunlight for the tree's pointed tips, they grow dizzy. That's partly because they've just smoked marijuana. Not a common practice in 1965, especially among squares, as anyone would agree these four are. Or three of them. There is a leader. There is usually a leader when men leave their established perimeters, and today it is Quinn Davies, a tanned, open-faced man with, accoutred with artifacts of a Native American ancestry he wishes he possessed. Normally, Quinn would wear a blazer, like the rest of them, but today, he's donned what strikes his pals as a costume, a purple velvet coat and heavy moccasins that prove far better suited to navigating this soft undergrowth than the Oxfords they're sliding around in. Only Lou manages to keep pace with Quinn, despite the fawn-like skittering this feat requires of him. Lou would rather look spasmodic than risk falling behind. These men all moved to California recently, driven by a lust for space that can't be satisfied by old cities with their tinge of Europe and horse carts and history. There is an ungoverned feel to California's mountains and deserts and reckless coast. Quinn Davies, the only bachelor in the group, is homosexual and was on the lookout early for a graceful exit from Bridgeport, Connecticut, where his family has lived for generations. After the Navy, he followed the Beats to San Francisco. But now that he's here, they've proved maddeningly elusive. Still, there are always sailors who share Quinn's view that a man can be a multitude of ways depending on circumstances. He has a flickering hope about one of the other three, Ben Hobart from Minnesota, 
married to his high school sweetheart, a father of three. But it's too soon to tell. All four work in San Francisco in banking, doing their part to feed an expansion that will draw more restless folk like themselves to the city. Over drinks on Montgomery Street a few weeks back, they get, got to talking about grass, as marijuana is known even to those who have never seen it. They know grass is around, but what is it exactly? What does it do? All four like to drink. Quinn Davies drinks so that those around him will drink too, which occasionally makes possible an unexpected adventure. Ben Hobart drinks because it subdues a greedy energy that can find no outlet around his wife and kids. Tim Breezley drinks because he's depressed, but that isn't a word he would use. Tim drinks to feel happy. He drinks because after several bourbons, he's overcome by a sensation of soaring lightness, as if he'd finally set down a pair of heavy valises he didn't realize he was carrying. Tim Breezley has a complaining wife and four complaining daughters. Inside his small Clement Street house, he drifts in a tide of shrill feminine discontent that followed him here all the way from Michigan, ranging from aggrieved and exhausted, his wife, to, infantile, to shrieking and infantile, the baby. No matter how much Lou Klein drinks, and he drinks a lot, a part of him is always removed, watching with a faint detachment as the men around him get plastered. Lou is waiting for something. He thought it was love until he married Christine, whom he worships. Then he thought it was fatherhood, then moving west, as they did two years ago. But the sensation of waiting persists, an intimation of some approaching change that has nothing to do with Christine or their kids or the house in Belvedere on a man-made lake where Lou swims a mile each morning and sails a little sunfish. Life is good. It's perfect, really. Yet Lou is haunted by a sense of something just beyond it, something he's missing. Charlene, whom they call Charlie, is six. This morning, she scrutinized Lou, wrinkling her sunburned nose, and asked, where are you going? Short trip north, he said, some fishing, a little duck hunting, maybe. You don't have a gun, Charlie said. She watched him evenly, her long, tangled hair raking the light. Lou found himself avoiding her eyes. The others do, he said. There will be no fishing, no hunting. What Quinn divulged that afternoon on Montgomery Street as they drank and smoked their parliaments and roared with laughter before driving their big cars home to their wives and kids was that he knew of some bohemians who grew grass in a forest, in, in the middle of a forest near Eureka. They welcomed visitors. We can go overnight on a weekend sometime if you like, Quinn said. They did. How can I possibly know all this? I was only six and stuck at home despite my fervent wish to come along. How dare I invent across chasms of gender, age, and cultural context? Trust me, I would not dare. I got lucky. All four men's memories are in the collective consciousness, at least in part. Surprising given their ages and downright miraculous in my father's case, he died in 2006, 10 years before Mandela's Own Your Unconscious was released. So how could my father have used it? Well, remember, Bix Boughton's genius lay in refining, compressing, and mass producing as a luscious, irresistible product, technology that already existed in crude form. Memory externalization had been whispered about in psychology departments since the early 2000s, with faculty speculating about its potential to revolutionize trauma therapy. What really happened? Wouldn't it help you to know what you've repressed? By the time one of my father's caregivers told us about a psychology professor at Pomona College who was uploading people's consciousnesses for an experimental project, my father had little to lose. He'd had five strokes and was expiring before our eyes. He wanted in. It fell to me to greet the young Pomona professor who wore red high-top sneakers. 
along with his two graduate students and a U-Haul full of equipment, early one morning at my father's house in 2006. I parted the sparse remnants of my father's surfer shag and fastened 12 electrodes to his head. Then he had to lie still for 11 hours. I sat beside him for most of the time. It seemed too intimate a process to let him undergo with, with strangers. I held his floppy hand while a wardrobe-sized machine rumbled beside us. After 11 hours, the wardrobe contained a copy of my father's consciousness in its entirety, every perception and sensation he had experienced starting at the moment of his birth. It's a lot bigger than a skull, I remarked to one of the graduate st students as he wheeled over a hand truck to take away the wardrobe. My father still wore the electrodes. The brain is a miracle of compression, the professor said. I have no memory of that exchange, by the way. I saw and heard it only when I reviewed that day from my father's point of view. Looking out through his eyes, I noticed, or rather he noticed, my short, uninteresting haircut, the middle-aged gut I was already starting to amass, and I heard him muse, but hear isn't exactly the right word. We don't hear our thoughts aloud. How did that pretty little girl end up looking so ordinary? Let us return to the men scrambling behind or alongside, in my father's case, Quinn Davies, their guide. A river flashes in and out of view, far below, like a snake sliding among leaves. As they climb, the men's stumbling and guffawing yields to huffing, wheezing, and struggle. All four smoke cigarettes, and none exercise the way we think of it now. Even Ben Hobart, one of those preternaturally fit guys who can eat anything, is breathing too hard for speech by the time they crest the hill and glimpse A-frame, as the house is known. Tucked in a redwood clearing and built from the cleared redwood, A-frame is the sort of whimsical wood and glass structure that will become a cliche of 1970s California architecture. But to these men, it looks like an apparition from a fairy tale. Is it real? What kinds of people live here? Compounding the eeriness is Simon and Garfunkel's sound of silence welling from hi-fi speakers facing outward on the redwood deck. A-Frame's mastermind, Tor, has somehow managed to wire a house in the middle of a forest, approachable only on foot. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. So we're going to, we're open to questions, and I think we're going to just shout them out, right? Yeah. I think we, we'll shout them out, and I'll repeat them um, so that everyone knows what they are. So fire away. I'm going to move around here, actually. Yes? So while I was reading The Candy House, I really appreciated the chapter that focused on D&D, and I have this burning question of if you've ever played before, and if you do, what kind of character you <laughs> so the question is, um, there's D&D at Dungeons and Dragons um, in the Candy House, and the question is, um, did I or do I play, and what was my character? Um, well, I'm glad that my younger son is not here, <laughs> because I'm going to reveal that he is really my connection to Dungeons and Dragons. And um, there was a period when he, when we hosted a, uh, like a weekly game for him and his friends, um, they would come after school and play, and I would, you know, do some baking, mostly so that I could eavesdrop on them. Um, and in fact, there was a, a kind of a long history of Dungeons and Dragons in our family, because my husband played at the very beginning, and he has, the, he still has his old books, which are practically like handwritten manuals. They're right from the start. So I've never been actually that interested in playing, although I have played a little. We played as a family. But what really interested me about it was the, the manner of the storytelling, particularly the way it is both, the way that there's so much data built into it, the way that numbers drive so much of the action. 
And even the characterization, you know, you, you roll a dice to find qualities and those qualities together make a person. Well, you could sort of say that's a description of mother nature creating a person. Um, so I was very interested in, in the, the numerological aspect of Dungeons and Dragons and also about its deeply compelling narrative power because what I, sometimes when I would watch these games, I think, this is moving so slowly. How do they tolerate it? They're like futzing about, can you go four steps or five steps? And you know, I just thought, how, how is this possible? But what was clear was that the, the narrative pull, the deep involvement was so immense that it was captivating for the people who were playing. So as a storytelling device, it caught my attention. And whenever that happens, I try to figure out a way to use it in fiction in some way. Other questions? You mentioned at the beginning that you essentially grow up with the squad while you were procrastinating, procrastinating at the beach. Um, guess, do you often work at writing multiple works at the same time, or was it more a case that you essentially put a half each aside? So, how do those different works, um, I guess, influence each other at all while you're working on one of the different different of completion? So the question is about working on more than one thing at a time, and how is that, how is that possible, and how do the two things influence each other? A Vista from the, I, I really was procrastinating. So Manhattan Beach is a historical novel set, a kind of noirish uh, historical novel set in New, on the New York waterfront during World War II. It, it is about as unlike A Visit from the Goon Squad as it could possibly be. Um, but it, and it also required a massive amount of research. And I, I think that, and it actually required a lot of research before I could even begin because although I don't use my own life at all, or I'm not very interested in writing about people like me, I do rely pretty heavily on environments that I remember, sort of times and places from my own life. The Redwood Forest that I was reading about briefly there is a perfect example. Um, you know, the, the, the drama is all made up, the people are made up, but that place I remember really well. So as soon as I started trying to even move toward thinking about writing Manhattan Beach, I realized that I, I had no times and places to draw on because this was before my lifetime. So I think I began to sense that this was really going to be a longer process um, than I thought. And while I was taking some steps toward researching Manhattan Beach, for example, um, you know, I wore a Mark V diving suit at one point. That was in 2009. I went to a reunion of um, army divers, unbelievably. Um, and, I, and I got involved in an oral history project at, in those same years before 2010 um, interviewing people, especially women who had worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard during the war. And that was really fascinating because they were really at the ends of their lives. They were, in most cases, well into their 80s. And reflecting back on their lives and telling the story of their lives in some sense. And that got me thinking about, about retrospect and storytelling and what it's like to know how the story ends before it begins. Um, and that, I think, is the one way in which Manhattan Beach did influence A Visit from the Goon Squad, because I originally thought that that book would have a straight backward chronology. That was my plan. I thought the question we're going to be asking as we read is not what's going to happen, which is the more conventional question that, that we have as readers, but what was that like? Sort of knowing, and, and, and I was curious about the narrative impact of of already knowing the future when we read about the past. And I think that that curiosity was really inspired by these women basically laying out their stories um, in a pretty, uh, in, a, in, a, in a definitive way, like this is what my life has been. Not, this is what I've done and you know, here's what I'll be doing next. It felt like the ending. Um, and in a way, it was. All of those women had passed away um, by the time Man Manhattan Beach came out. But the funny thing about that influence is that, so I, I loved my idea of this straight backward structure in A Visit from the Goon Squad, partly because it gave me a kind of cute option to have the book in two parts, with the first part being after uh, before, no, sorry, after 9-11, and the second part before. But as so often happens, at least for me, when I have a concept that seems kind of neat, 
uh, it was really flat in the execution. It actually didn't work. So I had to let go entirely of my um, backward structure and my neat division between um, post and pre-9-11. Uh, but I think what I retained was, was uh, an interest in knowing what happens later before you know what happens earlier. And I think you can really feel that actually in both books, um, in, including the jump that I just made for you, um, you know, fr um, from the 1970s to the 1960s. Yes? Thank you. That was, I could like listen to you read the entire book um, <laughs> that like, breaks several labor laws. Um, so I, I the, the concept of the memory, it seems to me that it is, in some ways sort of like a, well, I, I read it as a kind of a commentary on like we are already doing that, it's not like a high concept, right? Like we are already uploading our like, streams of consciousness into the world, into the void and, you know, on Instagram and Twitter feeds. Um, and at the same, and that's like coinciding with a certain, like this is like a novel novel, which, which is very exciting because there, we are like in the age of, in some ways like post, you know, fiction where there's not a lot of story instruction, minimalist, writing, first person, immediacy, et cetera, right? Like where, the, you know, immediacy is equated with authenticity, all that sort of, and like where, where did that coincide with the age of just social media? What is, the, what is the status of the novel out of that, right? And I felt like this in some ways was both addressing that, but also seeing how even when we have access to the entire person's consciousness, it actually doesn't tell us a lot about <laughs> like who they are and their story because it's, it's in this kind of like a uncertain, iterative, collaborative storytelling. And I was just wondering like how you came up with the concept of the of the memory and um, memory consciousness and how you thought of that to be having any sort of maybe tension or a commentary on the very act of like what what a novel does or what a what the form of the storytelling. Is. Okay, I'm going to try to oh, repeat that. To that. <laughs> well, I, it's a great question, um, and I, I'm not sure everyone heard, but the, the gist of it is, first of all, um, and I want to answer this very much, how did I come up with this device, which I touch on in the second um, chapter that I read? And, and then, on, in a broader way, how the questioner is asking, you know, how does this device, which allows people to externalize their memories for private consumption if they want, so basically to give, the, to give anyone a chance to review any and all of their lives from a present day perspective, and then if they want, and the inventor of this device thought this would just be kind of a sideline, but it turned out, um, you know, unintended consequences, uh, of course, if people want to, they can share all or part of their consciousnesses to a collective, which is what they must do if they want access themselves. So it's a, a give-to-get model that I think we all know pretty well. Um, so just to, so to jump into the, the most basic part of the question, I did not know about the machine at all when I started the book. Um, it really came into focus quite gradually and, and inductively. In other words, there were glimmers in the material I was writing of a world in which thoughts could be shared. And I, I followed those glimmers into the machine that, I, that ultimately explains how that's possible. So it was, it was the opposite of a high concept um, undertaking. Just to give you one example, the first chapter that I wrote of the book is called Lulu the Spy. And it's about, it's a, basically a genre-esque spy story that I wrote for Twitter at 140 characters. Um, so that was uh, back in 2012. And Lulu is narrating her mission um, in the form of the lesson she learns from each step she takes. But the way she narrates is through thought bulletins. The government has implanted a device in her brain because she can't be like taking notes. She's trying to infiltrate a bunch of plotters against America. So she just thinks in this certain way and these bulletins are received by, um, by her handlers. Um, and create a kind of mission log, and that's what we're reading. So right from the beginning, I thought, oh, okay, so thought sharing is possible. I mean, it's technologically possible in that story. And I got other glimmers in other ways. Like there's a piece called, um, 
rhyme scheme where a very uh, uh, kind of data-oriented guy in the 2030s is trying to figure out how to make his colleague fall in love with him. He's in love with her. Um, and he briefly considers t um, viewing her thoughts and memories uh, without her approval so that he can find out kind of what she likes and, you know, try to check those boxes. Um, but then he quickly dismisses that idea as really unacceptable. And that came about very spontaneously. And just to get back to the couple of things I said early on, the reason I write in this improvisational way is I'm not sure I would really think of these things if I just sat down and thought, okay, time to write a story. They come about spontaneously, and then if I like them, I kind of push further toward them. So there were these little glimmers of this world in which thoughts can be shared. But another point that you make, which, is, which I also recognized and liked, is that in a sense, this is just a more exaggerated version of what we already have. I mean, the internet is a kind of collective consciousness. It knows more about all of us than I'm sure we would ever want it to. Um, and so there's a kind of feeling of familiarity about it. Um, and, and I guess one more thing I'll, I'll address of what you said, and then we can um, you know, continue the conversation after, too, um, is you know, there's a question that hangs in the air, I think, in our culture and certainly in the book, about how fiction really fits into this, into this landscape that we all inhabit, particularly with our obsession with authenticity. And I am also fascinated by authenticity, but my fascination is more a fascination with our cultural fascination with authenticity. And I read a book many years ago that um, is called The Image by Daniel Borston. It, it reads pretty... Um, it, it, it does not read well anymore exactly. It's, it's written in a somewhat... It, it's, it, first of all, it's, 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 the book was published in 61. It's really about television in the 50s. Um, and it's written in a sometimes kind of sexist way that is a little hard on the ear now. However, the points that Borston makes are 100% rock solid. And one of the main ones is that he talks about a, um, a kind of system whereby mediated experience feels artificial. A press conference is artificial. It's created for consumption via mass media. So mediated experience feels artificial, and that leaves the, um, the consumer with a craving for authentic experience, which mass media tries to satisfy through ever greater feats of artificiality. I think I'm sure we can all think of examples of this right now. I'll just put one out there. Be real. Really? Um, <laughs> But it's, it's, it's an interesting lens through which to look at our, all of our media. We cra there's a craving for authenticity. You know, when my younger son was first watching um, like Twitch streaming, I thought, okay, the apocalypse has now arrived. We're not just arguing about video games, we're arguing about watching people play video games. Like, how could this possibly be interesting? I learned after watching with him for like five minutes, it was totally interesting because it mimicked the experience of actually being inside someone else's brain better than almost anything I've seen. You're seeing what they see, you're hearing their thoughts, kind of. It's obviously also performative, but you're, they're simulating their thought process for you and the whole, the result is a kind of wild transport into another consciousness. But the, the, what I really believe, actually, is that it's actually fiction that does that job more completely than anything that is image-based, I would say. And the very fact that you're looking at an image means that, by definition, you are on the outside of that person's brain. They may say, there are all kinds of, I mean, that, there are ways of trying to simulate in our life but letting go of the images and letting language do the work of giving you the feeling of being inside someone else's brain, I think is, is a specific thing that fiction can do and hopefully a reason it will stay um, relevant. We have time for one more question. All right, let's see. Here we go. I'm, I'm flummoxed 
and I'm trying to understand the process of how you make the, I'm not a writer. <laughs> I'm trying to understand how do you create those connections through such a spontaneous process? So the question is, so there are a lot of connections both among the chapters in The Candy House and between this book and A Visit from the Goon Squad. And the question is, how writing in this spontaneous way do I keep track of all this stuff? The answer is, I think I couldn't do it any other way. Because, well, it might seem like I have some kind of grand plan that I'm enacting, enacting via all of these connections. What is really happening is that I'm following, using curiosity, one connection into another, and, and in a way experiencing that revelation of connections much as the reader does. But the one thing I want to say, because I realize I actually haven't said this um, tonight, and I can, it can make it sound like I just spew out this stuff, and it's much like what you read. Oh, no. <laughs> what I spew out is a complete and utter mess. And especially with ensemble books, when I'm using some non-traditional narrative devices, um, the failure rate is really high. So I'd say about 50% of the first draft material that I wrote for both books and ended up being unusable, yet. <laughs> um, and, I, and I actually mean that yet, because it is amazing how material that feels like it just is, is never gonna come to life, if I wait long enough, I can sometimes find another way to do it. But I didn't find it hard to keep track of the connections. It felt, I guess, more like a family, a complicated family tree which is, which is somehow my family tree, or my fictional family tree. So I'm aware of the history that some of these people have because I experienced it by writing about them. Um, but the other thing I should say is, I also don't care if people keep track of these connections. It's absolutely unnecessary. And that's one reason that I feel so strongly about the rule that each chapter stand on its own and each book stand on its own. There's no reason to read Goon Squad before you read Candy House. In fact, I've started to think if you want to read both, that the Candy House is the better one to start with. Um, because I think you get that backward effect more going from Candy House to Goon Squad. So, I don't care if people keep track. It's there for fun, if it adds to the experience. Um, but it, the, the point of all of it is to be fun and to provide entertainment. So for people who find it work, I think you found it fun <laughs> to keep track of the characters. Um, but for people who find it work, forget it. Don't worry. You'll, some of them will, will sort of find their way together, and, and some won't, and it doesn't matter. All right, I think I'm getting the hook. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.